And it's just worth noting because you're like, that doesn't make any sense rejecting the binary. We grew up in a society where the binary has been presented as being natural. The gender and sex binary is part of our society's ideology. And then you have the definition of ideology there. It's the set of ideas widely shared by members of a society that guides identities, behaviors, and institutions. So because we have this gender ideology um, or gender is binary, sex is binary ideology in our society, it's hard to imagine that anything else can exist. But this is what I want you to take away from these pages of this chapter. No, I'm not going to ask you a bunch of questions about all of these different ideologies. But what I do want you to take away is that the gender binary is just one way of thinking about gender. It has become the dominant way of thinking about gender in societies, Western societies that have, uh, that embrace Judeo-Christianity. And a lot of it for people who are, are Jews or Christians, you know, it comes out of that book of Genesis. And, it, you know, it says God created man and woman. When that is your origin story for your society, when that is that religious ideology that you embrace and believe, then obviously that's going to impact the gender classification system that you create. So when we look at anthropological evidence of other societies who do not have this binary view of gender, it's worth noting that a lot of these are societies that either uh, never embrace Judeo-Christianity or they received it very late um, from missionaries and and they already had this kind of non-binary gender system in place. And once again, I'm not going to go over all of these. I do find it very fascinating because I think sometimes um, because the binary has been such an established part of our gender ideology for so long in our society, people like to talk about this as, as if it's newfangled, as if it was created by radical liberals and the internet and, and the media. Um, no. Like when you have this much anthropological evidence of people in societies all over the world uh, across multiple time periods that have had other ways of thinking and classifying, uh, you know, about uh, classifying gender um, beyond the binary, then that really refutes the idea that this is a newfangled based in, you know, uh, progressive radicalism that, you know, it just popped up in the last 10 years because the American Indians have had people in their society that they refer to as two-spirited forever. Um, and, and, and they were, and depending on whether or not it's a uh, man, woman versus woman, man. So they have, thir they, they separate these two. I um, mean, the Navajo have a fifth for gender fluid. Um, your book talks about in Hawaii and Polynesia, there are all these varied terms depending on the community um, to kind of describe people that we would consider to be transgender and or gender fluid. They mention um, in India and Bangladesh, the Hira, and Brazil, the Travistis, and in Mexico, or this community in Mexico, the Mooks, Mukes. Um, all three of those represent men um, who are performing exaggerated femininity, and they are classified as being a third gender, um, and, and it's unrelated to sexual orientation, um, meaning they can be uh, heterosexual or homosexual, so it's not like they're necessarily in same-sex relationships. Um, your book talks about all the places where gender is not tied to genitalia, but to status um, and, 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 and other, uh, other aspects. Um, and, and in the Dominican Republic, uh, they talk about, once again, how, and this was more in regards to sex um, than, uh, than gender, per se, because it's speaking about biological differences, but basically how this uh, nutritional de deficiency created um, the, and, and, and just genetics have created uh, individuals there who People do not necessarily realize uh, that they are women or they're girls until puberty. Um, and they say that there is a similar 
uh, phenomenon in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, and then, of course, there's just temporary sex switching. Um, I'm reading a wonderful book right now about the Basha Posh in Afghanistan, where biological girls are raised as a social boy. Um, and, and that's just because of their patriarchal society. Um, but then, of course, once they uh, become adults, they're expected to, to become socially women. Um, but in Albania, uh, the Virginisha, um, they're allowed to remain, um, so, they, socially, they are allowed to remain men into adulthood. Um, as long as they agree, you know, that they're not going to marry. Uh, and this is not a super new phenomenon because they said something very similar uh, existed in the Dahomey Kingdom um, uh, in Africa in the 1700s where women could be warriors, but the agreement was is if you were going to be a warrior, then you were not to get married, right? Um, you were not to occupy that space as wife or mother. And like I said, um, and I, I'm this is just photos that I found on the internet of examples of, of all of these, except for that top one, because you're, if you're like, that looks like, that looks like Wakanda and Black Panther. It is. But those characters in the movie, that, that all female uh, fighting force, um, they were based on the, the, the women warriors of the Dahomey, the Dahomey warriors. Um, but all of these examples, you, it's not like I said about you remembering the individual details so much as it is about you just understanding that in societies that are not defined by Judeo-Christianity, a gender ideology that is not binary is actually quite normative. So I know it might seem unusual and out of the norm and not what we're used to in the U.S. as we are expanding our kind of uh, awareness of these different kind of gender classifications. But for a lot of the world, this is not as non-normative as we think it is. And that's because gender is socially constructed. It's the process by which we make reality meaningful through shared interpretation. And so because it's socially constructed, that means different societies can construct gender, their ideologies, their definitions in their own way, their own shape, form, and fashion. And so your book kind of makes this point. It's not just that we construct male bodies and female bodies and we label them as masculine and feminine men and women, but we often layer objects, characteristics, behaviors, activities with these terms masculinity and femininity. We gender things. Um, and we don't just gender things, right? Um, I'm going to come back to gender binary glasses, but we divide and subdivide the binary. Um, and that makes it even more complicated, right? So, you know, it's not enough maybe to say, oh, um, you know, uh, cars are for, you know, th that's masculine. But this type of car, I don't know, uh, is feminine, I don't, a Hyundai Sonata. I, I, I'm just naming something off the top of my head. I, I guess it's stereotypical of me to not know a lot about cars, but I don't. Um, the example your book gives is that dogs are seen as more masculine than cats, but some dogs are seen as being more masculine dogs than other dogs, like a pit bull would be a more masculine dog, while a Yorkshire Terrier would be a more female dog, um, a feminine dog. Um, and your book talks about like a poodle is a feminine dog, but a larger poodle, a king poodle is a more masculine of that version. So see what I mean about it getting complicated? Um, so why do we do this, right? Why, you know, why do we gender things? Why do we gender colors? Why do we gender activities? Um, in your book makes the argument we, we are brought up in this ideology that treats gender as binary, and we're, we learn to put on these gender binary glasses, right, where we are taught and expected to see the world in a gendered way. And we continue to do so, um, sometimes without even being fully aware, because it gives us cultural competence. It allows us to understand what is expected of us in our culture, what is expected of other people when we see things in this gendered fashion. It's kind of like a cognitive uh, shortcut. Um, and at the same time, it's something that allows us to increase cultural awareness, right? So, you know, very quickly, you know, little boys will pick up on they're not expected to play with dolls, right? That dolls are a gendered 
object in our society and it's not for little boys. And they'll pick up on that and they'll learn that by refusing and rejecting dolls, by, by displaying this cultural competence, that in a lot of settings that this is going to get them affirmation. If they were to play with dolls, if they weren't to look at at dolls through these the the gender binary glasses instead if they were just like well this toy seems fun and i want to play with it then depending on the settings they might they might receive condemnation from you know their parents their siblings their peers maybe even their teachers and so we just learn that it's easier for us in a society to do what society expects of us. It's easier and it's safer. And so by wearing the gender binary glasses, we are able to quickly or more easily decipher this is what's expected of us as men and women to do masculine versus feminine things, to wear masculine versus feminine things, to buy masculine versus feminine things. Now, I talk about this as, as easy, but easy isn't the same thing as, as accurate or right. And so your book talks about how by wearing these gender glasses, it does result in blurred vision and blind spots, meaning it doesn't always allow us to see clearly and it, allow, and it sometimes encourages us to miss some things completely. And it talks specifically about, um, you know, research that, that shows this uh, is related to um, associative memory, right? How do we remember things? Like we remember things in relation to one another and there are tests for this um, and I give you a link there to the implicit association test that's run by Harvard. So we associate things with being masculine, feminine, and neutral and we tend to associate things with groups. Um, and, and like I said, it's a cognitive shortcut and it supposedly allows us to think and, and register things more quickly, but it also can lead us to make mistakes. Your book specifically mentions that associative memory reinforces stereotypes um, and possibly causes us to overlook when we are seeing non-stereotypical behavior. So they say that we are more likely to forget when we see people and see things that are not reinforcing our associative memory. So you might say something like, um, well, in my experience, women just aren't funny. Well, if, if that's the kind of stereotype that you're rolling with, you might implicitly, subconsciously be forgetting all the women you've maybe met that are funny or the times that you've seen women crack a joke, make a joke and it's made you smile, um, made you laugh. Um, and instead, you know, you remember more, you're more likely to remember the memories that align with your stereotype, right? So you think more about all the male comedians that you've laughed at or all your male friends that have cracked jokes and you've laughed. Um, and, once again, a lot of this, the research suggests, is happening on the subconscious level, right? So it's not like this is something you're purposely trying to do, but it's like, the, it's like a file system. Um, and we create files for categories that we, you know, expect to use more often. We don't create files for categories that we don't expect to use. So we kind of go throughout the world, sometimes in regards to gender, continuing to collect examples that kind of align with our stereotype um, and ignoring, not paying attention, not necessarily seeing um, the examples that don't align with our stereotype. Um, and so for people that are just interested in like, uh, these kind of this, this, uh, uh, just kind of neurological kind of basis of, of gender, gender binary and what we notice and what we don't notice, um, we'll be coming back to this, uh, in a little bit more detail in next week's chapter, chapter three. And so this is the final point, right? We're going to return to an idea from chapter one. Once again, no one's saying that difference doesn't exist at all, but it's overstated. We are definitely not from, we're definitely not opposite sexes, and we are definitely not 
from different planets. Not only are we from the same planet, we are probably from, you know, the same county in, 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 in nearby towns, right? Um, we just aren't that different. Uh, not our male bodies versus female bodies and not when men and women in terms of their actual behavior and characteristics. So it begs the question, and, and this is the question that came up in chapter one, why do we overstate the differences between men and women? What are the consequences of that? And a lot of that does have to do with power, who has it, who doesn't have it, who wants to keep it, and how this then relates to structural systematic inequalities. Um, that if we believe that women are more emotional, then maybe it allows us to be um, less likely to support them for public office. Um, you know, if we believe that uh, women are naturally more nurturing, then it might explain, you know, why, um, you know, we don't encourage more men to be stay at home dads, even when financially that might make a lot more sense for their families, or why uh, in family courts, men are much less likely to get sole custody or even joint custody of their children um, if custody is in contention. Um, you know, there is that kind of relationship between overstated difference uh, and these systems of inequality that relate to who has power in society and who doesn't. And so the question that's posed at the end of chapter two, if we don't learn the idea of the gender binary by observing the people around us, where does this idea come from? Right. So that's what I really want you to kind of take a moment to consider. You know, if you really stopped and took a hard look at people and push past the personal exception theory, what you probably would see is that a lot of people are cutting deals. Um, and if you really stopped and thought about a lot of our bodies, then you'd realize that without body work, a lot of us are not. Um, you know, vastly different um, outside of, like I said, our, our genitalia. And then if you stop to consider the sizable minority of people who are intersex, who are transgendered or, 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 or gender fluid or uh, some other form of, of non-binary that rejects the binary, then it once again just raises this question of, and this was the question that I pulled from page 17, you know, who cares? Like, who does this binary system serve? Um, and that is gonna be an idea that we continue to explore in this class. And that is it for this video.